Let's look at a system in Logix Pro that we'd like to solve. This is a dual compressor problem. There are several features here. One is that there's an input that is triggered at particular pressures. So, for example, the set point is 120 PSI, and when the pressure drops 20 PSI below 120, this switch activates so that we can detect how much pressure is in the tank. There's a secondary compressor over here and a second pressure switch on the other side as well. Of course, our PLC is up here, start, stop over here, and a pressure reading in the tank as well as a place where we can control the rate of flow coming out of the tank. So the way this is set up, if you go to help and then student exercises, you'll be taken to a page where you can click on the dual compressor student exercise. And you can read through here and see what the author has. Uh, the first challenge is fairly simple. One um, pump or one compressor should come on when the set point is, uh, you know, when it's below the, the 100 PSI set point. So we'll start there. That's a simple place to begin. You need to learn the syntax for RS logic type instructions. Notice we've got our command palette up here, and so it's pretty straightforward. All we need to do is whenever this switch tells the compressor to come on, turn it on. So let's set up a typical seal-in circuit to begin. And what we'll do is add in our regular start-stop. So we'll use the start button over here. And if you hover over it, you'll see that it's NO normally open. That's what we expect for a typical start. Now you notice I tried to drag the button and that didn't work. If you try to drag the start button itself, it gives you the address. Now this address is a little different than what you may be used to. I is for input, colon, one slash one, means word one, bit one. So if you look in the data table, you can see precisely which bit we're talking about. So here's input word one, and here's bit one, and apparently this particular bit is wired up to this switch, so that if I press this switch, that bit will come on. Sometimes it's worthwhile to make a simple program and just see how the system works. This is a very simple, dumb program that won't do anything. Now notice I just downloaded it. That means this program, which is junk, is now in the PLC's memory, and I can hit run. Now I can press the start button. Of course, it doesn't do anything. It lights up that instruction because now that instruction is passing power. Let's look at the bit itself that I, that I pointed out. You notice I said it was bit one, and as I press, well, the window disappears. Hang on. Notice as I press the start button, well, it's not doing what I expected. I expected bit one to come on. Ah, that's because I scrolled down. Let's scroll up and try one more time. There we go. That's what I expected. Bit one right here turns on and off. Now let me warn you, none of this is scripted. I'm going to design this program from scratch. There's one little thing that I've made. It's a toggle function. I'll show you that in just a little bit and show its use to you. I just wanted to save a little bit of time. But I hope that I make mistakes along the way because I want you to see how I recover from those mistakes and finally finish the programming problem. What I'm going to try and do is teach you some techniques, some common techniques that are useful. So let's start off, since we've got uh, the system ready to go, I'll put it back in program mode, go back to the command palette, and let's see, basically I want a run mode. So let's just add in the lamp. We're going to use that as our seal in. So notice I have to right click and choose edit symbol. It's important to do this so you can keep track of what's what. Right now I can't tell what's going on with this code at all until I add some comments. So this is the run mode lamp. I'm basically going to use it as a run mode uh, memory switch. So now if I just drag that address over here, O colon 2 slash 2, well that's output on word 2, bit 2, that's just tied into this lamp over here. And if you hover over it, you can see that. Don't worry about the extra zero before the final 2. This reads O colon 2 slash 0 2. That, that 0 2 is the same thing as just 2. So this is the same address. So there's the run mode lamp. Let's name this the start button. In fact, start PB for push button, a note that is normally open. And I thought I turned off sounds. Okay. So then the last thing I want is some way to stop it. And so we'll use the stop button for that purpose. And edit symbol. And this is the stop push button that is normally closed in C. Now if I download this and run it, we've got a very simple seal-in circuit. If I hit start, 
run light turns on, hit stop, it turns off. That's fine, but it doesn't really do anything yet. Now, I don't want the start button to simply force the compressor to start, so it's a mistake to say, well, I'm going to put another instruction down here and put the start push button over here, and then I'm going to put a, uh, an output address here. Apparently, the compressor, the, the first compressor is on, sorry, let me type, compressor number one. I don't want to forget to comment this. Um, Compressor 1 is apparently on output word 2, bit 0. This is not good, right? I don't want to use the start button because that means I have to sit there and hold it. What I want the system to do is automatically control this so that when the, the pressure goes up to the right level or down to the right level, the compressor comes on. So let's just try, instead of using the start push button, let's grab that sensor. We don't know exactly how that sensor works. Pressure sensor... S-E-N-S-O-R, number one, or P-E-1, you can call it. That's what they called it. We don't know how this works, right? We don't know if this switch is going to come on when the pressure goes up to that level. We don't know if this is going to come on when the pressure drops. Let's just try it and find out. A lot of times when you're programming things, you really need a place to test things out. And that's basically what I'm doing here. Especially in this little simulator, you're not going to break anything in the real world, so feel free to explore Let's hit run. Notice that the start and stop buttons don't really matter at all. Notice that the pressure in the tank is zero and the sensor is not active. It's not turning the compressor on. Well, I would like for it to turn the compressor on. So apparently I've got the wrong symbol. In other words, right now the pressure switch is not passing power. I guess the pressure switch will pass power once the desired pressure has been reached. So let's switch it, right? If it's not passing power now, that's a zero. Let's invert that to get a one and drive the compressor. Now let's download and run it. Of course, the compressor is going to start running because that switch was off. Let's see what happens once it gets up to the set point. As a matter of fact, I'm going to decrease the set point down to 40 PSI so that we can get there faster. And I'm going to decrease the outflow to 0% so that this compressor can bring the pressure up as quickly as possible and we don't have to wait forever. So what I expect to see happen is I expect to see this pressure switch come on, which means that the inverse of on is off and that should shut off compressor one. Notice I haven't included logic like I ought to, to, to recognize whether or not this thing's in run mode. We didn't have to press the start button, it just started running. And that's not necessarily a good thing. We want the control panel to actually be in control of the machine. So let's see what happens when we hit 40 PSI. We're at 37, 38, and there we go. Sure enough, pressure switch one came on. The inverse of on is off. That's why this instruction is not passing power. And so the compressor turned off. Well, that's great. Now let's give it some outflow. Okay, so we got 20% outflow. You see the pressure dropping. The pressure switch is still on. What that means is that this switch apparently has some hysteresis. Once the pressure reaches 40 PSI, it turns on, but it's gonna take a fall of 20 PSI from that level that's what's set down here before we've reached the point where the pressure switch will turn back off. Let me increase the outflow just a bit so that we can reach that point faster. In fact, I'll give it 100% outflow. Now the pressure's dropping nicely. I guess I could have decreased the range where we only needed 10 PSI, but here we are, 20. Yep, there we go. So 40 minus 20 is 20, and at 20 PSI, sure enough, the uh, switch changed state and the compressor came back on. So now if I shut off the outflow, it'll come back up to pressure. Okay, well that's all well and good, but what I really should have done is made the system work based on the status of the, the buttons, right? Not, not the current status of the buttons, but remembering whether or not the user has started the system. So if I include simply a condition based on that lamp being on, well, that lamp basically represents run mode, right? And so if the system's in run mode, it's possible for the compressor to come on. But if the system is not in run mode, then it's not possible. Let's go down, let's go back, download, run that. And notice the compressor doesn't do anything. The switch is off, meaning that it's passing power, but the compressor doesn't come on because we're not in run mode. So let's hit start. That'll put us in run mode. And that looks pretty nice, except that the light for compressor one's not on. Pressure's coming up nicely. I forgot the light, so let's go back and add that in. 
That's pretty easy. I could add in a separate rung that references light C1. Let's see. Can I grab the C1? Yeah, and that is address 2 slash 3. If you don't know what it is and you're not sure how to drag, just hover over the item in the simulator and after a few seconds or fractions of a second, it'll give you the address so you'll know what to type in. But this is C1 uh, run lamp. And it should be driven whenever the compressor's on. Okay, so I could do something like this. I could add in a condition that says look at output 2 slash 0 when that output's running then the lamp should be on. Let's go back and try it. It's good practice once you've made a change to go back and try it in the simulator and see if it works. Sure enough, I hit start, compressor comes on, the lamp comes on. Do I really need this though? Because basically I want this lamp to be on anytime the compressor's on. Well, there's another way you can do this. There are a couple of options. One way is to simply take this instruction and put it on the same row. Now, some languages don't allow you to do this, but RS Logics, which is what this is based on, does. The better way, in my opinion, is to make it look more like an electrical diagram. Put a branch around it and put the two outputs in the branch, as you see me doing here. Because you see the conditions for the lamp are the same as the conditions for the compressor. These over here, these two things are the conditions for the compressor and therefore the lamp. Now, there's only one problem with this. There may be times when you want that lamp on and you don't want the compressor on. So now I can eliminate this rung. Let's just choose to cut the rung. And there we go. So now this will work as intended. Now, if you look at the student exercise, there are several challenges. The next challenge is to alternate the compressors when the loading's light so that you don't wear out one compressor or the other. Another is coping with large demands on the uh, plant air. And then finally, detecting when one compressor is not enough and some encouragement to kind of explore on your own. So at this point, I'm not going to follow the student exercises. Instead, I'm going to make this thing work the way I think it ought to. Now, I don't want to wear out one compressor or the other, and so I'd like to balance the load. I'd like both of these compressors to run for similar amounts of time. And so somehow, I have to keep track of the difference between the times that the compressors run. And I can do a comparison. There, that's probably the way I'll go. The other thing, though, with compressors, it's pretty common. There, there's two common problems. Number one, you typically don't want them to run too long. So if a compressor is running for too long, it has a duty cycle. It needs to cool down. It needs to shut off and cool. The other thing is you typically don't want to start up a compressor until a certain amount of time has elapsed. And so um, we're going to incorporate all of that into this program. And along the way, I might take some programming turns that don't make sense and I'll have to backtrack on. But we'll see what happens. Now, there are actually two pressure sensors, and I actually don't know what the difference is between the two. Let's just try using the other pressure sensor to begin with and see what happens. Now, you'll notice when I change this address, lo this uh, Logix Pro simulator keeps the wrong um, comment. I can use it to my advantage because really this, this label is not associated with that address that I've just changed. But I can make a new label very easily by modifying the text that's still there. So there we are. There are a few, I don't know how to describe them, little details about Logix Pro that you have to get used to. Uh, but you'll figure them out along the way. They're not all that difficult. So now let's go back, download and run this. I just want to see if the other sensor works the same way. So right now the pressure is pretty low. Um, we're not in run mode if we hit start. Sure enough, yeah, it looks like that works the same way because the compressor has started. Let's just take this down to 40. Sure enough, we're at 43. That shut it off. Let's take up the outflow to 100% because I'm impatient and don't want to wait. I'll change this to only a 10 PSI difference. So once the system has dropped down to 30 PSI, which is 10 below my set point of 40, yeah, there we go. The compressor comes on. So sure enough, these two pressure sensors work the same way. <clears throat> I don't really need both. I don't think I'll bother using both. I'll just use one pressure sensor, and I guess I'll stick with pressure sensor one. So that was on address two. So you notice that the comment went back to pressure sensor number one. 
Okay. Now, keeping track of how long the compressors have run will be important. Now, the way I'm about to do this may have some problems. I don't know. I'm going to try something. I'm going to go to the timer counter tab, and I'm going to use what's called a retentive timer. Now, a retentive timer is only different from a regular timer in the sense that it retains the accumulated value of time. In other words, timers just keep track of time, right? As, as time advances, they count up how much time has elapsed and just keep track of it. Well, if you no longer assert the input to the, the timer, in other words, if the conditions on the rung leading up to the timer go false on a regular timer, that timer will automatically reset. But in a retentive timer, the accumulated value, or how much time is kind of on the clock already, remains. It's kind of like pausing a, a, a sports game. Now, RS Logics is a little different than other languages. Timers actually have their own file. If you look in the data table and you go to the timers file, You'll notice that there's a slash en indicating that there is an enable bit because the slash means that what comes after, whatever comes after it is a bit. This enable bit just tells you that the timer is enabled. There's a tt bit, which is the timer timing bit. There's the done bit, which is, again, a little different than other languages. And a dot pre. Now, that dot means that we're dealing with a word, 16 bits worth of, of data. And the PRE is the preset. It's kind of like what you set your alarm clock to. The .acc is a word, a 16-bit word of, well, 16 bits of data that tells you how much time has accumulated in that timer. And notice we have multiple rows to represent multiple timers. So it's not really that this instruction is the timer. The timer is a thing that exists in memory that you can reference. And I'll show you how to reference it. First thing to do is to select a particular timer number. So I will select timer 0. Now notice over here it's listed as T4 colon 0. The T and the 4 are the same thing, so the 4 is redundant. You can simply type T colon 0, and watch what happens when I do that. It puts in T4 colon 0 because the timers are in file number 4. That's what the 4 means. And then it asks me for a preset. Well, if I give it a very large preset number, I will not be able to demonstrate what's going on here. Now, in, let me tell you why. The time base is just how much time each increment of the preset represents. So, for example, right now this is 0.1 and the units are seconds. In the regular Allen Bradley Rockwell Automation software, you can change the time base from 0.1 seconds to seconds to milliseconds to all kinds of different things. But this is just the unit size. This is just how much one increment of the preset represents in terms of actual time. Unfortunately, in Logix Pro, we cannot change that, but this will be adequate. So the biggest number I can put in this preset would be a 16-bit value maxed out. Well, that is 65535 if you do the math. So that means that this timer would run for 65535 units of time. The unit of time is a tenth of a second. That's what this means right here. So it would run for 6,553 and a half um, seconds. Let's see how much time that is. 6553.5 seconds, because each one of the individuals are tenths of a second, divided by 60 would give me 109 minutes, divided by 60 would give me 1.8 hours. Now, I don't want to sit here on video for 1.8 hours, so I'm going to make these timers run for, well, actually, I guess for the retentive timer, this would be fine. I'm going to use timers for two different purposes. One purpose will be to keep track of how much time that each compressor has run, but the purpose of the other timers will be to time how much time each uh, compressor is off to prevent it from restarting. So my, my logic for starting the compressor is going to change quite a lot but I'm not sure if I'll be sorry that I put the lamp with the compressor. We'll find out. So this may be reasonable, and I will actually edit the symbol so I don't forget. I will call this uh, compressor one, um, I guess, usage. It's just how much time is on that compressor. And I'd like another timer like that for the other compressor, so I'm going to copy this rung, and then I'm going to paste the rung below. But here, if I have two different rungs that are referencing the same timer, 
both of them are going to cause the timer to either run or run. Matter, actually, the second rung will determine whether or not the timer runs. That's not what I want. I want two separate timers, so I'll choose timer 0 and timer 1. I'll edit the note, and this is for compressor 2 usage. Okay, so now I've got two timers, and basically I just want these two timers to keep track of how much time each compressor has run. So I simply want these timers to run when the compressors are running. So let's put in a couple of conditions here. One is that when compressor 1 is running, then the timer for it runs, and when compressor 2 is running, its timer runs. Now notice there's no symbol with this, so I'll have to edit it. Compressor number 2. There we go. So whenever each compressor is running, their associated timer will run. Whenever the compressor turns off, the accumulated value will remain in the timer, which is exactly what I want. That way, I'm, I don't forget how much time each one has run. Okay, that makes sense so far. Now, there's a problem here. Notice that I also want to set up a couple of timers to keep the compressors from turn, turning back on after those compressors uh, have shut off for a little bit of time. Now, you might think, well, why is that such a big deal? All you got to do is put a timer in. Don't use a retentive timer because you just want it to run and disable the compressor. And this may seem pretty straightforward at first. Of course, I have to choose a different timer. I've already used up, whoops, I've already used up timer 0 and timer 1. I'll go on to timer 2. And let's just pretend that I don't want the compressor to run for, I don't know, let's say 20 seconds. Okay, if I don't want it to run, well, that's going to seem kind of long on the video. Let's make it 10 seconds, okay? Probably should actually be longer. The compressor would take longer than that to cool down. But I can change this number later. For the sake of testing, I'll just say 10 seconds. Well, let's do the calculations. Tell you what, let's do the calculations for 15 seconds. That, you'll see why. If the time base is 0.1 seconds, a tenth of a second, then how many tenths of a second do I need to represent 15 seconds? Well, I need 150, right? Because 150 times 0.1 would be 15. So I'm going to have this timer, uh, and I'll use it. This will be from compressor 1, but I'll call it compressor 1 rest instead and you might think, well, okay, no big deal. I can copy this instruction. If I highlight this one, I can paste left. I'm trying to show you some tricks in the software as we go as well, so don't forget these things. You may want to follow along, too, while I'm doing this. And you may think, well, okay, the only problem is, let's see, when the compressor is on, the timer will run. That's not what I want. I want it when the compressor is off. That's what I want to happen. But is that really what you want? In this case, it might work okay, but don't you really want to detect when the compressor turns off? In fact, is there a situation where this would not work? Because understand, what these commands do is what's called level detection. And what that means is that if the associated input or output, whatever address we're looking at here, is high, then this instruction passes power. If that location is low, then this instruction passes power. That's all it means. It doesn't detect a rising edge or a falling edge. In some other languages, there, is, there are instructions particularly set up to detect rising and falling edges. In this language, there's not. And that's not exactly true. There's something called a one-shot rising, and it's a little bit difficult to understand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this. I'm going to do a file, save. I've already got it set to point to my examples so that you can download it. But let's just say this, and I want to show you some good practice. I'm going to call this compressor. You can see I started playing with it earlier so I'd have an idea of what I wanted to do, but I didn't finish it. Compressor, and I'll call it V1. This is a habit you should get into. As you code, you should say versions. That way, if you make a change, or if Logix Pro messes things up, which it has been known to do, you can go back to the previous version and not lose so much. So I'm going to call this V1, and you'll see me save this with version numbers, V2, and so forth. I want to do something a little bit different, though, for a moment. I want to show you the value of one other simulator. So we're going to pause on the compressor. I'm going to go to what's called the I.O. simulator. It's the input-output simulator. And it doesn't look all that exciting because it's just a whole bunch of switches and a whole bunch of lights with some binary coded decimal 
uh, number displays and inputs thrown in for good measure. And so you may say, well, what good is this? Well, think about it. I want to come up with some code that can do edge detection. And I want to play around with this function I told you about called one-shot rising. How can I do that? Well, I can do that in the simulator. Let me show you. I've already written a small program. It's called toggle function. And let me show you what it does. Let me just download it and run it. You'll notice it's got the one shot right here. And I have set up this switch, which you can cycle th through them by right clicking. I've set up this switch to be momentary. In other words, when I put my mouse over the switch and I hold down the button, the switch will make contact. But as soon as I let go of my mouse button, it'll stop making contact. And this is on I colon one slash zero. So it's bit zero on word one. And that's this, that's the address that this instruction is rep uh, referencing. Now you'll notice that I've used a bunch of B addresses. What are those? Well, those are memory. And in other languages, it's called other things, but these are just binary bits that we can use. Now it's being displayed as a decimal number, but really you should use this as bits. And notice you can change the way that the memory is being displayed. So we can use all these bits as individual bits, and they're just bits in memory that we can define to be whatever we want and reference them however we wish. So you'll notice that I have used bit 0, bit 1, and bit 2. That's this bit, this bit, and this bit. These are all three, all three of these bits are in use in my code. Now, let's see how the code works. If I press the button, this one shot is a special instruction. What it will do is it will use the memory address that I've assigned it to remember when something has happened. In other words, when I make this uh, address pass power, it will notice, oh, we've gone from off to on. And when it detects that, what it will do is it'll let that go through for one scan. Remember in ladder logic, it's constantly scanning, right? In fact, you can see the number of scans up here going crazy. It's going so fast, you can't even see all the counts. So it's going through these, these, this program extremely quickly. Back to the one shot. When I make this switch go from low to high, the one shot will detect that rising edge, okay? And then once it detects the rising edge for one scan, when we come back to the net, well, let me back up. It'll detect it, it'll allow it to go through, but it'll turn this memory address on, this one, zero slash zero, it'll put a one in that bit. And when it does that, the next scan through, the way this works is, It'll see that this is on. It'll see that the bit has already been enabled, and it will not allow it to pass through. So this particular bit over here is 0 slash 1 instead of 0 slash 0. It will be on for only one scan. In other words, that will allow this bit to represent when the rising edge occurs. Now, without further ado, let's just see what happens. I'm going to press the button and hold it down. Now, you'll notice that o slash, or 0 slash 2 is on. Oh. It went off. Notice it's not toggling back and forth. I thought it was called a toggle. Well, it is. Let me explain why. Notice that I've got the push button on. The one shot remembers that it's already seen the push button go from off to on. So it set a bit in 0 slash 0. Turn that on. And it turned on 0 slash 1 for just one scan. You didn't get to see it because the scans occur so fast. Okay. When I release this, Notice that that resets bit 0 slash 0, but it doesn't change the status here because of all this code. Now, that was a lot to say. Let's go through that again. When I release the button, notice that this one shot saw the transition from high to low, and so turned off bit 0 slash 0. Okay, so the idea behind this one shot is that you get one shot. The, the, there's, the, the true signal passes through for only one scan or one shot. Now notice that 0 slash 2 is off. When I press this again, it turns on, release. Press it again, it turns off, and it's toggling based on my momentary activation of the push button. Now how does that work? Well, one of the difficulties here is you've got to understand that memory address 0 slash 1 actually turns on. It just only turns on for one cycle, and that's too fast for you to see. So you'll never see this be highlighted and do what it's supposed to do. Let me turn down the scan speed and see if we can see it.
No, we still... Well, yeah, there you go. I don't know if it'll show up on video, but every now and then, you see a flash. There was one. There was another. You see a flash on this instruction and this instruction. What that means is that it's going from false to true. So let's think it through. If I were to push this button right now, the, the bit 0 slash 0 is off, so the one shot would let it through. 0 slash 1 would turn on. If 0 slash 1 were on, this would be true. Uh, right now, this memory address is on, so the inverse of on is off, so that would not get through there. Since the address here is would, well, would be on once I press the button, then this address, the inverse of on, is off, and power would not get through, so 0 slash 2 would shut off. Now, remember that the PLC goes through scans a whole lot faster than I can push the button. So I will still be holding down the button, right? But the one shot will have set bit 0 slash 0. I'm still pushing down the button, so 0 slash 0 is still on. And the one shot will say, well, now I've already let that signal through once. I'm not going to let it through again. And so what will happen then, checking my battery life. So what will happen then is 0 slash 1 uh, will shut off for that scan. Well, what would happen then is off would invert to be on, but it's too late because this is already off again, and so it would remain off. So watch it happen. You saw the flash, and sure enough, it's off. So this is a toggle function. Really what it's doing for me is it's detecting the rising edge. Now you might realize, well, that's well and good, but some other languages can detect falling edges. Can this do that as well? Yes. I will simply flip this to an inverting instruction, download that, run it, and notice what happens. When I hold down the button, that particular bit does not change, but when I release it, like now, it switches. So it's on release or on the falling edge that the uh, bit 0 slash 2 changes state. It may be better to give these some names. Maybe we could call this the toggle bit. Okay. But basically all this toggle bit is doing is helping us uh, use a momentary switch to act like more of a wall switch, right? When you go into your room and you turn on your light, the light just stays on. When you turn it off, it stays off. So how can we use what we've learned here with this toggle function and these one shots to control the compressors? Well, with these ideas, let's go back and think about it. Let's see, simulations, dual compressor simulator. Well, let's see, remember my problem was that I wanted to detect the falling edge of the compressor. In other words, when the compressor shut off. Well, that's kind of like, instead of having this push button here, that's kind of like having this output. Now, remember that this bit comes on. Well, let's see, when does it come on? Well, it comes on when this shuts off, right? Because when 1 slash 0 shut off before, uh, let's see, it went from on to off, then immediately this instruction would go true. The one shot would allow it to pass. And so this particular... Um, a bit would more appropriately at that time be called a falling edge. So I don't really even need this toggle. I can cut that out and simply put in the motor address. Now whenever the motor shuts off, I should detect a falling edge. So let's open up version 1. In fact, I don't know if this will work. I'm going to try it. I'm going to copy the rung, and then I'm going to open, I think I'm going to open, there we go, version 1. And I'm going to paste it down here. Let's see if it lets, lets me. Uh, that didn't work. Paste rung below. Yeah, there we go. It let me pull it in. So really all I had to do was put a one shot on this row, and then what will happen is when the compressor shuts off, this timer will, will run. Well, that won't work, will it? Because if I do that, uh, let's see, I have to pre-select. If I do that, then what I really want, I want to lock in this timer and make it run. So maybe this is not needed at all. Maybe all I really need to do is 
wait until the compressor shuts off and use that to prevent the compressor from coming on until the delay is done. Yeah, I think so. So all that stuff with one shots, that was interesting and useful, but maybe I don't need to use it. I may come back to it later. I don't know. Let's see. So maybe I don't need to do edge detecting a detection after all. Let's see if it causes me trouble to just say when the compressor is off, start a timer, and basically don't turn the compressor back on until that timer is done. Now how would I prevent the compressor from coming back on? Well, unless this timer is done, then I'd want it to, I wouldn't want it to come on. So I could simply grab an instruction and say, well, let's see, when timer number two is slash done. That's the done bit. This is a little different than other languages. You don't just put T colon two in here. When this is done, then let the compressor run. Compressor one rest done. There's a problem here. If this timer has not run, then it's not done. What I really want to say, this is a little bit different condition, is when this timer is not running. Now that's the timer timing bit and it's inverse logic. So I'm going to change this to an inversion. And instead of using the done bit, I'm going to use the timer timing bit. The timer timing bit is just a bit that's on when the timer is accumulating time. Now let's think that through. If timer two is not running, which would be the case when we first start the program, then the compressor can come on. Once the compressor, uh, let's see, the only problem is that the compressor is going to shut off actually at the very beginning. This won't allow my compressors to come on very quickly, but that might be okay. Let's think through it. The compressors initially would be off, right, when the program first starts. So that would make the timer start running. So the timer would start timing and the compressor could not come on. Once that timer was done timing, then the compressor could come on. So if the compressor came on, the timer would not be timing, so the compressor could stay on and run until the pressure was reached or some other condition shut off the compressor. Okay, yeah, that should work. So let's see. Uh, I like that so far. I think I'll do the same thing for the other compressor. So I'm going to copy this and paste run below. It should be the same kind of logic, except of course I'll use timer 3 since it's unused. Notice the preset goes away because that timer has no preset. I'll use the same 15 seconds and of course I'm dealing with compressor 2. Now I'm going to save this because I've done a little bit of work, but I'm going to save it as version 2. Notice I haven't really tested this yet. And also, I don't have any way to cause compressor 2 to run. So let's copy this rung, paste rung below, switch this to compressor 2, and of course the lamp, probably lamp number 4. Let's find out. And if we hover about above it, yeah, it's output 2 slash 4, so that is C2 run lamp. And the timer timing bit, notice the um, node disappeared because I never named the timer timing bit. Let's say uh, uh, C1 uh, not, yeah, that's going to be confusing. Let's say C1 resting. That way the logic is if C1 is not resting, then it can, can go. Uh, now this would be the bit for timer 3 and that timer is associated with compressor 2. All right, now of course I need to rename this. This would be compressor 2 rest. Now let's see, the same pressure sensor is going to drive both compressors, and that's okay for beginning. Neither compressor will run unless we're in run mode. And the amount of time that the compressors each have run will be accumulated, so we don't forget it. Uh, it'll also be uh, calculated or accounted for rest. So let's, let's play around with this thing and see what it does. It'll download, run it, put it in run mode. 
I expected both compressors to start because there's no pressure and oh well of course timers have to be done yeah there we go okay so like I said the timers had to run for their 15 second rest time now both compressors are running let's take the flow down to zero percent let's take the set point down so that we can reach 40 psi pretty quickly that will make our life go quicker and I'm troubleshooting and developing our code notice that the retentive timers are counting up time uh, I don't know why timer 2's timer, retentive timer, didn't count up time. I thought it should. We'll look at that in just a second. Oh, because I have no preset, that's why. I'll fix that in a minute. Now, notice that the other two timers, the rest timers, counted up 15 seconds. Again, they were running while I was talking. And I think would have prevented the compressors from running. Well, let's try it and see. So let's give us some outflow. Let's dump some of the pressure in the tank. And to make our lives quicker, we'll go down to 10 PSI. And the, so down at 30 PSI, it should start running. There we go. So now let's take the outflow down to 0%. And sure enough, it comes back up. Now, let's see. Now, compressors are both resting. Let's make outflow go to maximum. Let's see if we can dump pressure in the tank before the compressors are done resting. It's going to be a close race. We're at 30. Hey, we hit it. We're at 30. Notice the compressors are still resting and cannot start until their 15 seconds have elapsed. So that works. Our, our rest timers are working just fine. Now, is it really necessary to have both of the compressors running when the outflow is relatively mild? So let's say that the outflow is, you know, 5% or something. It wouldn't really make sense to have both compressors running at the same time. What we might want to do is have the compressors by default just trade off. Now, let's see. I think the way I would want this to work is if the pressure dropped below... Uh, I don't know, let's say 10 more PSI from the set point, then I would want both compressors to run. Now, I don't have a way to sense that. Notice that as a human being, I can look at the pressure and see what it's doing, but the PLC is blind. The PLC has no idea what the actual pressure is. The only thing the PLC has available to it is an on-off signal that has some hysteresis in it. In other words, this pressure sensor uh, gives me a true value as soon as it hits 40 PSI, but it only gives me a false value once it has dropped down to 30 PSI. Then it only goes to true again once the pressure has come back up to 40. So the, the on-off switch point is different for this sensor, right? It only turns, uh, let's see, on at 40 PSI. It only turns off at 30 PSI because of the way I have this sit. This, this 10 would be the range or what they're calling the span. Uh, in PSI. It's how much below the set point uh, would determine the, the hysteresis. I can make the hysteresis band really small if I want. Say one, P well, it looks like it only goes down to two PSI. And so then once the pressure drops to, you know, just two PSI below the set point, then the compressor is turned back on. Now, this is fine, but like I said, I really don't want both compressors to run all the time. I don't see a need in that. What I would rather do, well, I guess that would be a trivial solution for making sure that both compressors run an equal amount, but maybe that's not what I want. Maybe I want these compressors to take turns when the load is light. How would I determine when the load is light? Well, that's a little difficult. In order to do that, I think what I'm going to have to do is set a, let's just set a, a pressure like we'd want in a real system. Let's say 120 PSI. Oh, that's, oh, this can go up quite far. Okay, let's make the numbers, yeah, let's, let's say 120 PSI, and let's put in a hysteresis band of, say, 20 PSI or so. Now, this gives me an idea for this other pressure sensor. Let's say that the flow was so large that one compressor was running and it couldn't keep up. Okay, so let's say that we had our program set up where one was running, the other one was not, and the outflow was just so high that the first compressor couldn't keep up. In that case, what would happen is the pressure would drop down even farther. So 
let's let's put a set point that's lower here. Let's say uh, I don't know. Let's say if the pressure drops down to 90 psi. Okay. Um, in that case, I want a second compressor to come on and help with the load. And this compressor would not shut off, let's see, until it's reached 90 psi, but it wouldn't come on until 70 below. Um, is that what I really want? I think so. Well, I think I might make this 10 instead of 20 for the band. Okay, so I'm not sure how I'm going to use this yet. But I think what I'll do is I'll make both compressors come on when the pressure is just so low that both compressors would be useful. So that would be when this switch is on. So if, if this switch is on, both compressors should come on. Now, let's go back to program mode because I want to change the operation just a little bit. I like what's going on with the rest timers. I think they're working just fine. But I don't really want both compressors to come on. So let's see if I can think of the, the logic. Instead of just looking at one pressure sensor, um, there's a couple things I'll want to do. I want to trade off the load between the two. So I wouldn't just say put pressure sensor one here to always drive compressor one and then some complicated logic of say just pressure sensor two. Actually it wouldn't be that complicated, right? So it would be like, okay, there's our backup compressor. I don't really want that. I want to do something a little more intelligent. What I really want to do is make it so that whichever compressor has run for the lower amount of time, I want that one to come on first. So the only way I can think of to, oh, let me not forget, I've got to change this preset. 65535, there we go. So the only way I can think of to do that is to compare the accumulated value. In other words, the amount of time that each of the compressors have run. So to do that, what I'll have to do is take the difference between those two. Or I guess I could just do a comparison, actually. So let's see. Uh, let me include another rung for logic. Yeah, let's go back. Wrong place. I need my command palette. So let's see. I guess I'll put the rung right here since it's associated with these retentive timers. And I'll use a comparison instruction. Now in other language, comparison instructions might look a lot like the regular uh, level detection instructions. But in this uh, Alan Bradley world, or uh, Rockwell Automation World, it looks a little bit different. They look like blocks. And it says, I want to compare two things, but understand these are numbers. These aren't really uh, digits or binary digits, right? They're not on off signals. So, what do I want to compare? Well, I want to compare the accumulated value, which is a 16 bit number. Well, how do I address it? Well, timer colon, representing the particular timer, timer zero. And then dot for a whole word, ACCA. I wouldn't put a slash here. A slash is wrong. A slash would indicate that I mean a bit. I don't want a bit. I want the entire word. And I'm going to compare that to the accumulated value in the other timer. So timer one dot ACC. So what this instruction will do, it'll take two words in, compare them, and give me either a true or a false on this line. Now, I think what I will do, at least temporarily, is just put that in memory somewhere. So I'll use, whoops, that's not the instruction I wanted. I wanted an output instruction. And so let me just use a bit. So far, I've not used any, so I'll just grab 0 slash 0. And I will call this, uh, let's see, what would be logical? If A is greater than B, then this will be true. So if Compressor 1 has run more time than compressor 2. Uh, C1 run more than C2. If that's true, then compressor 1 has run for more time than compressor 2. Okay, now how could I use that? Well, if compressor 1 has run for more time than compressor 2, then I would want compressor 2 to come on. So, I think what I would want to do is just simply 
reference that bit. On the other hand, if that's not true, well, think about it. If it was the other way around, if I had a larger number here for compressor 2, then this comparison would not be true, and this bit would be off. The inverse of off is on, and that would allow a signal to get through to turn compressor 1 on. And that's what, what I would want, right? Because if, if compressor 2 had run for more time than compressor 1, this bit would be off, which would allow compressor 1 to run and kind of catch up. Okay, now that's all well and good. The only problem is I'm afraid that when I do this, what's going to happen is compressor 1 is going to run, and as soon as it has run for more time than compressor 2, the bit's going to flip. That's going to shut off compressor 1 and turn on compressor 2, and they're just going to keep oscillating back and forth. I don't really want that. What I would rather do is seal in compressor number 1. So... Uh, let's see, I'm not sure that this logic is going to work, but I'm going to try it. So if I seal in compressor 1, the problem with a seal in is you have to think of what should shut it off. Okay. Not only that, but I'm going to have a little bit of a problem here because... I don't really want compressor 1 and compressor 2 to run uh, necessarily at the same time. My logic will have to be a little more complicated than I, I think I'm prepared for because the conditions aren't just based on the pressure sensors anymore. I think what I'm going to have to do is add in some rungs with some logic to decide which compressor should be turned on uh, and get it off of these rungs. because otherwise I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up with a lot of trouble. So let me just go ahead and do that. Let's see. I thought I added a rung, but it, it's not showing. Yeah, I did add a rung, and it didn't allow me. Let me try again. There we go. So I think I'll have to have some logic that says... Uh, whether compressor 1 should be on and compressor 2. And I think I can remove all of these conditions. I'm just going to move them up here because I know that the logic will be dependent upon these conditions. And I think what I'll be able to do is just leave the compressor rungs as they are with maybe one more condition to turn them on once this other logic has decided it. So let me show you how to uh, make this work. Right now I'm getting a little confused because I've got so many different conditions I don't know what the condition should be for turning on the various compressors. Now I'm not going to worry about the compressors resting because I'm going to think of a couple of, I don't know what happened there, a calendar. That's strange. Not sure how that happened. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll make a new spreadsheet. I thought I would. Excel is acting quite strange. There we go. I'll make a new blank worksheet. And what I'm going to do is just create a truth table. So I'm going to look at all the different inputs that I think should affect the compressors. And I'm going to have a compressor request. So let's actually, let's do that first. So I think I'm going to have two different rungs. This, the logic on these two rungs may be quite similar. And I'm going to have a compressor request. So let's use a bit in memory 0 slash 1. And let's call this C1 request. Do I want C1 to come on or not? So copy this. Uh, that won't work very easily. Let's just put another output on the other rung. And I will use another bit, bit 2. And I'll call this C2 request. And basically, whenever there's a request for compressor 1 to run, 
And whenever there's a, a request for compressor 2 to run, as long as they're not resting, those compressors will run. Now all I really have to do is figure out the logic of when do I want to request these two compressors to run, individually or collectively. Now the various things it depends on are pressure sensor 1, pressure sensor 2, which one has run more than the other. So really these are the same condition. So I really only have three separate conditions. There are three separate things that I'm looking at to determine whether the compressors should be running. So let's just take those inputs and put them into Excel. And I'll show you why I'm doing this here in just a second. Uh, the inputs are I colon 1 slash 2. That's cryptic, so I'm going to put the... I am going to put the particular label here as well. So I colon 1 slash 3 is pressure sensor number 2. And really it's the, the help me out, I'm, I'm drowning here, sensor. V colon 0 slash 0 is really a, well, I'll just label it C1, run more than C2. Now, based on this, there's going to be two different outputs, as I said. One is going to be the C1 request on B colon 0 slash 1 and B colon 0 slash 2. And that's, let's see, C1 request and C2 request, respectively. I have no idea what's going on. I think I'm accidentally hitting buttons that I'm not intending to hit. Okay, now the reason I set this up is because you can enumerate all the possible combinations. For example, one possible combination is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so forth. Notice all I'm doing is counting in binary. And there are only eight possible combinations of these bits. And in fact, there they are. That's it. And all I have to do is think through all of these and think what that means in terms of which compressors I would like to have run when. So let's see. Pressure sensor 1 is my primary sensor. Let me label it that way so I can think of it that way. In fact, maybe I'll leave its official name there and insert a row and just call this, uh, let's see, primary sensor and secondary sensor. And this is just a comparison. I'll, I'll leave it as it is. Let's see. If pressure sensor 1 is off, what does that mean? Well, remember these pressure sensors only turn on once they've reached the set point. So if, it's, if the primary pressure sensor is off, then we're certainly not at 120 PSI. If the secondary is off too, well, we really need both to run, right? I don't care which ones run more than the other. I want both on. Okay. Again, same logic here. I really don't care which one has run more than the other. If we're well below pressure, I just want both of them to run and get back up to pressure as quickly as possible. Now let's see, if the primary pressure sensor is off, in other words, we haven't reached 120 PSI, but we have reached uh, the secondary level of 90 PSI, then I only want one compressor to run. And now, which compressor has run is important. The question is, has compressor 1 run more than compressor 2? The answer is no, compressor 1 has not run more. Therefore, I'd like to turn on compressor 1, but not compressor 2. Because, see, the secondary sensor is satisfied. I've got at least 90 PSI in the system. I just need to bring it up a little bit more. So I just want one compressor to run, and the one I will select is the one that has run the least, which in this case is C1. If I had the same combination, though, and compressor 1 had run more than compressor 2, then I would want the opposite output. I'd want compressor 1 off, compressor 2 on. I think this truth table stuff is <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me, I think this compressor or this truth table stuff is going to work out well. 
<clears throat> what if the primary sensor is true, meaning that we've reached 120 PSI, but the secondary sensor is off? Um, I don't think that's going to happen, right? Because if the system's at 120 PSI, it's certainly above 90, and so this would be on. Now, if somebody comes along and sets the secondary sensor higher than the primary, I'm going to have to call that op operator error, right? I don't have anything better that I can do here. What would be more ideal is to have the actual values of the pressure. If I had the actual uh, continuous value of the pressure rather than an on-off signal, I can make the decision based on just that one sensor value, but I can't, right? So um, I will have to say I don't care what the output is here because these are conditions that I never expect to see happen. Okay, well, let's continue. What about the case where the primary sensor's on and the secondary? Well, in that case, we've reached our set point, right? Why would we have either one of these on when we've reached, regardless of which one has run most, uh, in other words, this bit, why would I turn the compressors on once the primary set point has been reached? I don't think I would. Now, here's the nice thing about a truth table. All you have to do is program the ones. Let me show you what I mean by that. I need compressor one to come on in these three instances. And I need compressor two to come on in, let me make this selection it's a little more complicated, in these three instances. So programming the, comp the compressor request really is what it is. Programming them is actually pretty straightforward. As a matter of fact, Notice that both compressors come on with this condition. So what I'm going to do is just do a raw programming of this. And unfortunately, let's see, I may have to flip back and forth just a little bit. You'll see the pattern here in a moment. Let me program compressor one request first. And you'll notice the pattern as I go along. It's zero, zero, zero. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means that I'm getting a zero on all those bit addresses. Well, that means I need to invert them all. Well, that's already been done here, right? This is 0 inverted is a 1, 0 inverted is a 1, 0 inverted is a 1, 1 and 1 and 1 is 1. In other words, the inverse of 0 anded with the inverse of 0 anded with the inverse of 0 gives me a 1. And that works for generating this particular 1. But I also want 0, 0, 1 to generate a 1. How can I do that? Well, it's pretty simple. Put an OR in here or around all of this, use the exact same terms. I'm going to cheat just a little bit. Pasting is a little bit strange in this code, but there we are. You can say, well, wait a second. You're just doing the same thing. Yeah, that's true. It's because I need to access, whoops, I need to access the same addresses. Now, I'm not done yet with that row. What I really wanted was 0, 0, 1. So that's the inverse of this, you see. So when this is a 0, it'll pass power. When this is a 0, it'll pass power. When this is address is a 1, this will pass power, and we'll get a 1 for C1 request, which is exactly this row. Okay, what about the next one? Well, for this one, I'd like 0, 1, 0. Pause the video and see if you can figure out what I'm going to do next. Well, hopefully you paused it. Pull these inside. I'm just going to OR one more time. I need the same addresses, so I'll just copy. I have to temporarily paste to one side or the other so I can drag it down. There we go. And then I can copy, paste right, copy, paste right. Now it should be, what was the pattern? Zero, one, zero. So that's an inversion, not inversion, and inversion. Okay. Notice I need something very similar to this with the exact same addresses for the C2 request. As a matter of fact, for these two, the logic is identical. These first two rows are identical for C1 and C2. It's only the last row that's different. So to save myself some time, I'm going to copy this rung. I'm going to paste the rung above this. 
I'm going to change this address out. So now I'm talking about C2. Eliminate this row. Pardon me. Now the rung is exactly where the logic is exactly the same. That takes care of this part, but now this one's wrong. What I wanted was a 0, 1, 1 instead of a 0, 1, 0. And so a 0, 1, 1 looks like that. Now that I've coded it, it's a little bit bulky, right? There's some simplifications I can make here, but it should work. Let's find out. Download. Run. Uh, let's see. I haven't pushed the run button yet, so the compressors can't actually run, but there's a request for compressor 2 to run. Does that make sense? Well, let's see. We've already reached our set point, so I'm not sure why it would run. Let's see how it's getting through. It says if pressure sensor 1 is not satisfied, oh, well yeah, of course, the pressure is dropping. Let's shut off the outflow so we can keep this constant. So actually now there's a request for both compressors to run. And the reason for that is because we're well below 90. I need to hit the run button. This may be working. So both compressors are running. We've reached 90. Notice that one compressor shut off. Compressor 2 is on because compressor 2 hasn't run as long as compressor 1. Now I still don't like the fact that the timer for compressor 2 is not running like it should. But I think the system might accidentally be working already. With the exception of this one timer, and I'm not sure why it's not running. Oh, it's because it says it's done. It needs to be reset. I need a little bit more logic to deal with the retentive timers. We'll deal with that in just a second. For the time being, it's always going to appear that compressor 1 has run more than compressor 2, and that's okay for now. Okay, checking my battery life. So now, what do I want to do? Well, I want to keep testing it. Let's allow some flow to, to go out. So 100% flow, pressure is dropping rapidly. One compressor should not be able to keep up. Let's see what happens. It'll have to drop below what, 100 before a compressor comes on? Compressor 2 should come on because apparently it's the one that has run the least according to our timer. Compressor 2 is doing the best it can but the pressure is still dropping. It won't take long for the pressure to drop below 90. It may be too long for the sake of this video so let's bump this up to 95. There we go. So as soon as we drop below 95, the other compressor I would think should come on. Oh yeah, the hysteresis. The pressure sensor's on. No, it's off. No, no, it's still on. Yeah, it'll have to drop to 85. I'm not, rem I'm not thinking of the hysteresis. So once we drop down to 85, that's when the second compressor should come on. Let's see if it works. We're at 88. And how will it come on? Well, let's see. Pressure sensor 2 will shut off. That means that there will be a request right through this line right here. Let's watch it and see. Here we go. Boom. There it is. So both compressors are running. The extra compressor, which is compressor 1 that has apparently run the most time, will not shut off until we reach 95. There we go. We've reached 95. Now, if my retentive timers were just working like I expected, everything would be fine. As a matter of fact, Notice I'm always going to have a problem once one of the retentive timers reaches its maximum value. I actually would like some way of removing the accumulated value or setting it to zero or something. And if you think about it, let me shut this off. If you think about these timers, I really don't care how long the compressors have run. I'm just trying to compare how much time one has run versus the other. So. The accumulated values keep track of, you know, letting the, the compressors cool down, and I'm not really trying to track the life of the compressors or anything. So let's do this. Let's add a little bit of code to work on this. Think about it. If the two were at the same time, or if 
both compressors, we all know, if both compressors had run, were running at the same time, I wouldn't want to just zero out the accumulated value. But if the two accumulated values were equal, then I could zero both of them out. Let's see, would that always work? Yeah, that should work because if one compressor is running, but not done, and the other one gets the chance to run, as soon as they're equal, then it's going to clear it out. So how, how well... You don't see how it's going to clear it out. How am I going to make that happen? Well, let's add in a, another line of logic and simply do another comparison. I'll say if the accumulated value in timer 0 and the accumulated value in timer 1 are equal to another, one another, then I would like to reset the accumulated value of both of these timers. How can I do that? Well, there is a very handy instruction called reset. And that instruction can be used on all sorts of addresses, but basically what it does is it resets the entire word that you point it to. So timer 0.acc, that's great, that'll reset this timer. Uh, what about the accumulated value in this timer? Well, for that, I'll simply OR around it. Notice I don't like putting outputs on the same row. That's bad practice because it looks like there's a voltage drop that's lower across the two, but I'm not going to harp on that right now. Let me cut. Uh, I didn't mean to cut that. And I don't think there's an undo. Nope, no undo. One other thing you have to get used to in this program. So paste right. Move it over where I wanted it. Paste left, move it down where I think it makes more sense, and refer to the other timer. This should work. Uh, except I have to reset the done bit here. Now, I'm going to use a trick to do this. Actually, you know what? Rather than resetting the accumulated value, I think I'll just reset the whole timer. That'll take care of the done bit. and the accumulated value. Now I just have to do it once manually. We'll go into the timers file and the done bit of timer 1, which is giving me problems, I'll just set to 0. Download, run, start it, and I don't want 100% outflow, that's going to take forever. Let's go with 0%. There we go. Actually, I do want 100% outflow because I want to see both of these running. Both are running. And I want compressor 2 to remain on. Let's see if that's what happens. We've reached the magic 95. Yes, compressor 2 stays on because it has accumulated less time. So you can download this example program, play with it, try to understand what I've done. There are some simplifications. Um, let me go through that. I feel like I might run out of video time. If I do and this video ends, just download it and play with it. How do you simplify this a bit? Well, you notice that both of these are conditions for these two rungs, as are these two. You can simplify things, uh, let's see... This may not look as simple, but it will be. So now I don't need that anymore. Uh, the only difference is the pressure sensor and that. So I'll pull this outside. Pull this in here. Pull this in here. And you see what I've done basically is called factoring. We'll talk more about Boolean algebra later, but I have factored out this. Now, unfortunately, in Logix Pro, there's no easy way to in eliminate that intermediate line. So you've got to learn to be a little tricky and move things around so that finally you can click the left elbow and delete that extra bit there. Now, let's see. Pressure sensor number one has to be off to go this way. I could have simplified things with this bit instead and combined those two, but 
I didn't. Uh, let's see, any simplifications here? Yeah, there's a big simplification. You notice that this particular instruction appears on all the rows, so no problem. There we go. That's the same thing. Now let's see, this instruction appears on these two. This instruction appears on these two. Before I combine, combine the upper two, let me combine the lower two here to show you how that would work. And so let's see, I'd put an or in here. Put this here, this here, and this, I guess I can leave it there. And I've got the exact same logic. Oop. By the way, if you right click on the white space, it just goes full screen. So if you accidentally miss and you right click when you're trying to cut something, that's what will happen. Now notice there's something interesting here. Uh, it doesn't matter whether this pressure sensor is on or off. If C1 has run more than C2, then C2 is going to be the one requested to run, in this case when the pressure sensor for number one is off. It turns out you can actually eliminate both of these conditions. That's actually a really nice simplification. What about up here? Did that happen and I missed it? Yes. Pressure sensor 2 could be eliminated. Uh, actually, could it be? No, I was wrong. I was wrong. Let me see if I can remember what was there. I wish I had saved before I did all of this. I think that's what I had. Because it's not as if it doesn't matter if this is on or off. It doesn't matter if, if both of these are off or both are on, then the signal gets through. So I've got to be careful with that. Uh, oh, but there is a nice simplification. Look at this. Pressure sensor number one being false can come outside of the conditions. Okay, so that's a little simpler. Ah, here's a simplification. You notice that these rungs are really this, they're, they're connected at the same points. Here, if I13 is true, then it doesn't matter if the bit is on or off. So I will simply cut that. That allows me to cut this out and cut out the extra rung. I thought that was going to happen. This should be the same logic. However, I'm going to save this as a new version. And notice that in this program, it's a little different than your typical Windows program. Now, notice I'm not going to save this as version 2. If I've totally messed things up, at least I can go back to version 2, which probably is a little late now anyway. I should have saved when I had all those complicated instructions there. But let's download and run it, see if it works the same. The pressure's dropping. I need to turn it on. So start. Why is it not running? There is a request. There it goes. Why is the second compressor not running? I probably messed up the logic. That's probably what happened. So I'll challenge you to go back through this. This has been a long session. Go back through this, get to where I was, and see where I made the mistake. Because I'm sure I made a mistake. This was working before. Since both are off, both compressors should be on. But I've made a mistake somewhere along the line. That's why it's not working.